Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Letitia Chambers, President and CEO of the Heard Museum, one of the world's preeminent museums of native arts and culture. The museum, which receives 250,000 visitors annually, was founded in 1929 and recently has been updating its exhibitions and facilities. Letitia joined the Herd after a distinguished career, which includes serving as the head of higher education for the state of New Mexico and as U.S. representative to the United Nations General Assembly. Letitia has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Letitia, for joining us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Mark. So you have had quite a career arc going from education in New Mexico to the U.N. General Assembly and you, of course, have been very involved in Native Arts and Cultures for your entire career arc, serving as well on the board of the Native Arts and Cultures uh, Foundation. So chat a bit about your transition into leadership of this wonderful museum in Phoenix. Well, you know, I spent most of my career in Washington, D.C., and uh, was in government and then in business. And I didn't realize when I came to Phoenix to lead the Heard Museum how much I would be depending on my business background. I also have had uh, a lot of experience in the arts, on the boards of museums. Uh, also, I'm an art collector, uh, as well as, of course, my educational experience. And the Heard Museum, like most museums, are above all educational institutions. So. I find that it's both the uh, art background, the museum side is important in that, but the business side has been equally important. So you have a magnificent collection, you have a magnificent property, it's very prominently placed, but you also have a, a, a business to run. You need to drive attendance, you need to drive earned income, you need to drive contributed income, and without that, the collections just cannot be properly exposed. That's exactly right. We're our a business of over ten million dollars a year and about seven million of that comes from earned income. The rest is contributed income. So that earned income is extremely important. The museum couldn't exist without it. We have a collection of over 40,000 objects and the care and preservation of those objects is expensive. We have 12 exhibit galleries. Four of them are longer term exhibits, but the others are changing galleries and we change most of them at least annually. So that's a lot of exhibits to mount. And we need to do that to keep the interest strong. We have a lot of repeat visitors at the Heard Museum. It's very interesting, over 70% of our visitors are from out of state, but many of those are repeat visitors because people all over the country and indeed around the world love the Heard Museum and consider it to have an integrity in its presentation of Indian arts and cultures. And we do this by keeping a balance between being a history museum and an art museum. And in the arts, we have both traditional arts and contemporary arts. And, and that contemporary art side is very, very important because we're showing the cultures that are living dynamic cultures. Indian cultures didn't die at European contact or at the end of the so-called Indian wars. Uh, Indian cultures are still thriving. And sometimes they've had to fight to recover from past problems uh, and indeed the way they were treated by the government and others. But in fact, they do thrive today and artists in Indian country today practice traditional arts, but also some are very contemporary cutting edge artists. And artists are influenced both by their cultural traditions and by the societies in which they live. So we're very eclectic and it's a very exciting museum. When I was a child, my perception was that uh, much of what was presented was presented in the context of what remained. Whereas now, it is presented more in the context of a continuum to look at what thrives. And that's a, that's a really different experience as, as a child, and my children have had a, had a very different experience. Talk about 
how you take the context that you have, your wonderful collection, historically very relevant, and how that, that is leveraged to, um, to help advance uh, awareness of the current state of Native cultures and the current state of art here in uh, Indian country. We have um, three exhibits in the museum right now that I'm going to use as examples uh, to demonstrate how we show both the historical and the continuity. As you walk into our museum, you can see a thousand-year-old Pueblo pot, uh, a piece of pottery from uh, a certain Pueblo, and right next to it you can see a 50-year-old pot that show similar motifs and you see the continuity through time of, the, uh, of these Pueblo artists. We also have an exhibit of pottery by Nampeo, who's probably the most famous Hopi potter. Uh, she is the great, great grandmother of Dan Naminha, who is a, a painter uh, who is Hopi and Tewa and also the grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother of some other very famous potters. And so we have exhibits in the museum right now of Nampeo and her descendants who are doing Hopi pottery and following those traditions and also evolving those traditions. But we also have an exhibit of Dan Naminka and his sons Arlo and Michael and they are very prominent abstract expressionist artists. Uh, Dan is both a painter and a sculptor, Arlo is a sculptor, and Michael is a photographer and does some installation art and some painting. So very cutting edge. And so it's very interesting to see how native culture has evolved. The original pottery from a thousand years ago, the pottery as it began to evolve further a hundred years ago, and the artists of today, those, both those who are doing the traditional pottery, but also those who are working in other media and are also influenced by mainstream art movements as well as their Indian traditions. So much has been lost, but much abides, and, and much is being richly evolved by very active artists in the community with reference to the past but not captivated by the past. That's exactly true. The thing that's so exciting about Indian art today is that you see influences of Indian art on mainstream, mainstream art movements and you see the reverse. You see where mainstream art movements have influenced Indian artists. And I want to give you a specific example that uh, we are going to have an exhibit on that will open in 2013 in the fall. When Dale Chihuly, the glass artist, was a young man, he uh, was at the Rhode Island School of Design and then he went out to Santa Fe and taught at the new Institute of American Indian Arts right after it had been created and he was greatly influenced by the Indian art that he saw, by the traditional images. He also had grown up in the Pacific Northwest and was very taken with the Northwest Coast basketry. Mm -hmm. Both that basketry and other Indian images influenced his glass blowing. Hmm. And you can see it when you look at his Baskets I'm, I'm running, of glass. I'm running back. I'm running back some of his works in my mind. I did not know this, but this, this is absolutely the case. And when you look at the, some of those baskets that he has blown in glass, you see the influence of the Northwest Coast and other Indian basketry in it. He also makes some cylinders that have Indian motifs, primarily from Navajo textiles. And so we're going to have an exhibit that pairs Chihuly's basketry, glass baskets, and his cylinders with Northwest Coast baskets, some from his collection, some from our collection, and also uh, some Navajo textiles from our collection. It's going to be a very exciting exhibit, and it will show that influence that 
uh, the, the Indian arts and artists had on Chihuly. But likewise, Chihuly has had a, a big influence on Indian country. There are a number of Indian artists now who work in glass. Tony Jojoba is one. Preston Singletary has become uh, extremely well known and has had exhibits around the country and around the world. We recently, last year, had a, a Singletary exhibit. Uh, Marcus Ammerman, there are others who are now working in glass. And so that influence goes both ways. And so that's one of the things we want to show in the future at the Heard Museum is, is focus on this dialogue uh, between Indian artists and non-Indian art movements. But we also want to focus on how traditional Indian art has influenced today's Indian artists. When you look at native arts and culture, it's sort of like talking about white arts and culture. And talking about native cultures or Indian cultures seems to be such a disservice to the, to the rich diversity that is uh, within that completely inaccurate uh, umbrella term. How do you adjudicate amongst such a, a wealth yet, remain, uh, yet, yet, yet retain some sort of thematic integrity for a museum that is dedicated to a, 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 a people that, um, that do have connection to each other despite the disparities and the differences and the, 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 uh, the different histories and so on. If you think back to uh, the Americas pre-European contact, there were many cultures here, uh, many different nations, if you will, uh, Indian nations. And they were quite diverse just as France and Germany and England were diverse, or just as the Middle East is different than Europe and Asia. Or Asia or... Uh, so those differences abounded throughout North and South America as well, with some uh, cultures that in some cases were very similar and related to each other, and others that were very different. Uh, there were many different languages here, and some of those languages would be related, like Iroquois languages or Algonquin languages, but there were several different families of languages, in fact, many different families of languages, which tells you how diverse the cultures were. And that's why it's very important when you're referring to American Indians to talk about cultures, not culture. There have been, though, moves toward what some people might call pan-Indianism, uh, the boarding school era, when right. Indians were, uh, Indian children in the beginning were literally kidnapped from their homes and sent off to live in boarding schools. In later years, the boarding schools uh, became a little more enlightened and weren't such desperate places. Um, and there are some uh, of the, those who went to boarding schools in their later periods who felt that they were very good schools. Um, but the thing that they did do was throw Indian kids from many tribes together. And that caused a great deal of intermarriage, of course, because many people meet their spouses in school. Right. There was also a, a great amount of relocation. Uh, tribes from the East Coast were moved west. Uh, tribes from that, that uh, maybe wintered in the northern part of the U.S. and summered in the southern part and went back and forth, were driven into small reservations uh, and forced to live in one area, and others forced to live in contiguous areas. And so the intermarriage and the going back and forth between tribes increased significantly, although I should point out that there was a great deal of trade among the Indian nations pre-European contact the North and South American continents were filled with farmers. Uh, in fact, right here in this area, in uh, Phoenix, where we're uh, having this conversation today, um, there was a canal system that was extremely sophisticated. And the current canal system is based on the original Indian canal system. And those canals fed uh, irrigation to uh, make this a farming area. Uh, hundreds, even a thousand years ago. That's so interesting. The culture of Native peoples go into literature, 
uh, poetry, song, dance, various performance, uh, jewelry, um, in addition to sculpture and, and, um, and the visual. We deal with all of the arts. We have a, a very significant jewelry collection, and our shop uh, actually features some of the most exciting jewelers working today. And, uh, and your Indian. buyers are fantastic and knowledgeable. I, I know from personal experience. So. Oh, they truly <laughs> are. And you know, when you buy a piece of art from the Heard Museum shop, you know you're getting an authentic work and you know you're getting work of the highest quality because our buyers buy directly from the artists and they are so knowledgeable about those who are working in the field. So we literally have the best of the best. We try to keep a variety of price points in the shop so that people who come and want to take home some Indian art, whether it's pottery or kachina dolls or jewelry uh, or textiles, uh, we want everybody to be able to find something that is in their price range. But we, in fact, do carry those very finest of the uh, fine arts. And that's part of your your business uh, uh, picture as well. So you said that about 70% of your budget comes from earned income. People are always surprised to hear that nonprofits uh, are funded primarily through earned income across the board. So you have the shop. Um, I'm assuming you have uh, rentals and then ticket sales, uh, general admissions, and then special exhibition? We do. We have our shop. We also have a contemporary uh, fine art sales gallery that's primarily painting and sculpture. That's called the Berlin Gallery after the uh, wonderful couple who built the building to house it. We have a bookstore called Books and More, and it has books and souvenir items. And it's a wonderful boutique bookstore. And so many people love to browse in bookstores, which uh, gets harder and harder to do these days as the internet takes over a lot of book sales. So it's a wonderful uh, store to shop in. We have a, a cafe that has uh, w gotten wonderful reviews. And in fact, Bon Appetit featured in its January issue our pasoli recipe, and, uh, which is a traditional American Indian dish. In the next uh, three to five years, uh, what type of transformations would you like to see uh, occur at the herd? Well, I'm going to start with the transformation that we've made in the last two years, two and a half years, really. We have uh, updated the business systems. The, the books were literally, for a $10 million business, kept on linked spreadsheets without proper bookkeeping uh, software. So we have upgraded that. We've upgraded our whole IT system. We were on outdated platforms. Mm -hmm. We have gone wireless in the museum, That's both great. for our own use as staff and for our visitors. Um, so all of the business system side, you don't care what software you're using to uh, it promote breaks. your ticket sales. You don't care what software the shop or the cafe are using. But that makes a big difference to the ability of the business to have the kinds of information that it needs for decision making and also to be efficient and effective and accountable and transparent. We also have had some great challenges in the infrastructure itself. Our buildings are uh, people say they represent uh, the best of Old Phoenix. So we're doing something that we hope will encourage people to give to support our infrastructure. Uh, Arizona's 100 years old this year, and uh, the Heard Museum is over 80 years old and one of the oldest cultural institutions in the Valley. And we're encouraging people to give to what we're calling the Centennial Fund which is to preserve the Heard Museum for the next hundred years. And if we don't do that, if we don't take care of the infrastructure, if we don't build capital reserves, then the future of the museum is truly threatened. And capital reserves are every bit as important as endowment, in some ways if not more so, because you can't go into your endowment to take money out if you have a roof that suddenly has to be replaced. Um, but a capital reserve gives you that ability to do a project when you need to do it, and then you can rebuild those reserves for the next item that will need replacing. What you're doing is the unglamorous work 
of figuring out how to actually preserve the institution so that it can be the asset that it has been over the last 80 years to the community. If we are going to be able to continue to mount the exciting exhibits that we've had um, in the past and that we're planning for the future, then we have to have the infrastructure to do so. And you did also mention previously that most of your visitors uh, come from out of state. So you have about 150,000 people who are coming and part of the reason they are coming to Phoenix is to see this unique museum. So it is also a question of the economic vitality of this region. You have amazing institutions. You have this museum, the, the Phoenix Museum of Art. You have uh, MIM. The Desert uh, Botanical the Garden. The Desert Botanical Garden. Uh, you have the ASU uh, Museum and, and a range of other institutions. I'm sure I'm missing uh, a number of, uh, of great institutions, plus the performing arts uh, venues. These jewels need to stay if Phoenix is going to sustain its diverse economy. One survey that was done recently uh, said that uh, the tourists said that the Heard Museum was second only to the Grand Canyon in the thing that they most wanted to see in Arizona. That, so is, we, that is so interesting. Yeah, we found that pretty exciting. Now, you've also received some pretty substantial coverage recently for a number of your exhibits. Could you talk uh, about that? I've tried to uh, unlock the creativity of our staff and uh, have people think more boldly about the exhibits and what will be interesting to our visitors and how to present the information in the most exciting, interesting ways. So we have actually had Associated Press cover two of our exhibits in the last six months. So we've had articles in newspapers all over the country uh, which is very exciting for a museum to be covered so extensively. Literally hundreds of articles about our exhibits. And also one of my favorite exhibits, a uh, sculpture exhibit that we have, was uh, reviewed in the New York Times this year. So that's very exciting to us. So we are getting the kind of attention for our exhibits um, that I, I think uh, will help sustain our visitor flow in the future. Well, Letitia Chambers, thank you so much for coming on today and for sharing your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you.